Okay, hi, hi everybody. Um, thank you very much for joining us for this webinar on AI tools for materials research and nanotechnology. The, um, the webinar is run in conjunction with the journal Nano Futures here at IOP Publishing in the, in the UK. And first up, just a big thanks again to everyone for taking the time to, to join us for this webinar, for this hour webinar. I, I know time is very precious at the moment and, and thank you everybody for, um, for joining us. I can see there are people from many time zones on the call. So thank you, thank you for, for making time and for joining us. So my name is Alex. I am a publisher here at IOP Publishing and I look after the three nano journals that we, that we have here at the Institute of Physics. Um, so they are Nanotechnology, uh, which was launched way back in 1990, and uh, uh, the first journal, in fact, solely devoted to, 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 to science and technology at the nano scale. We have Nano Express, a new launch journal that, that's purely open access, and the journal that really trying to highlight tonight and to, to talk about a little bit tonight is Nano Futures, which is a uh, a, a relatively new journal itself, launched about six or seven years ago, and in which we're publishing very select articles, so articles that we think will really help define and set and shape the future of research across across nanoscience and, and technology. And I've included a link to, to Nano Futures at the bottom of the slide, and I, I urge you to go on there and have a little look at the content in there. And of course, to submit your own works for consideration in the journal, or indeed any of the, any of the three journals on, on the screen here. There's contact us details on there if you'd like to message myself or the team after this, if you have any queries about the journals. And, um, and yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. So on, on to the webinar and um, super excited. We have four wonderful speakers here too, who've joined us tonight for this webinar, for this, uh, for this webinar on AI tools for materials research and, and, and nanotechnology. We have uh, Keith Brown, who's going to open up and speak first, and Keith from Boston University is going to speak a bit about um, materials discovery at the sort of fentagram scale using, using scanning probes there. We, Keith will be followed by Sergei, Sergei Kalin, who's at the University of Ten Tennessee, and, uh, and, and we'll talk a wee bit about um, automated SPM and, and the discoveries therein. Um, we then have Amanda Barnard, who's joining us from Australia National University. Thank you, Amanda, for, for getting up early and for joining us for this, for this webinar. And Amanda will talk about machine learning models for nano and, and, and technology. And we will finish up with um, Yaroslava Yingling from North Carolina, who will talk about um, really sort of fusing data in material science. So this was bridging the gap between simulations and experiment with, with, with data science. So four wonderful presentations, around about 10 or 12 minutes long each presentation. And we will finish with a, a short Q&A where, where all the speakers will join us for this, for this Q&A and, and be available for your questions. And super quickly on that note, if you do have a question and you wish to post something for, for, for any of the speakers or all of the speakers, you should see a little questions tab in the bottom right hand corner of your screen and you can input your question there and we will we will um, read out as many of, of, of those as we can given the, the time that we have available at the end so so thank you very much all thank you to the speakers thank you to, for joining us and uh, Keith I will pass over to you if that's okay to get us started with your with your presentation thank you thank you all right um, and Appears like I'm sharing the correct screen, perhaps. So we will begin. Um, so thank you very much for the invitation to, to speak to you all today. Thank you for those of you who've gotten up early and those of you in the UK who are staying up late. Um, it's my pleasure to tell you about some of the work we've done in the area of self-driving labs and uh, specifically related to uh, very, very small nanoscale samples. Uh, and so I'm coming to you from Boston University where I have a research group in mechanical engineering. So the uh, motivation for our work comes from kind of an observation on how we traditionally do experiments, physical experiments. So the, the typical way this happens is a, a researcher, you know, professional researcher will use the knowledge of the literature, use the knowledge of the experiments that they've done so far, and they will choose the next experiment to do, and they'll go and do it. And then they'll repeat this process so they have enough data to publish a paper. And this is an inefficient process for a number of reasons. One, uh, experiments are generated fairly slowly. Uh, and secondly, um, the, the, uh, most of the experiments that get performed never make it to 
published literature. They end up being discarded as things that sort of train this experimenter. And, and why is this important? Well, if you think about what we're trying to achieve, you know, we're, we're currently facing vast global challenges and things like clean water, clean energy, and, and, and other kinds of societal challenges. In order to solve this, we need new materials. And while the material space is insurmountably large, it's basically uncountably many numbers of, of different materials that we could potentially study, more materials than there are you know, atoms in the observable universe. And so the question is, how do we take the traditionally lethargic research process and accelerate it to be able to address this large material space. And it's clear that we need to think about any possible advantage we can get and utilize it if we want to have any chance here. And so what my group's been studying and, uh, and several others uh, is, is how to develop and how to utilize what's called the self-driving lab. And so we're going to try to accelerate both sides of this process in order to get as much advantage as possible. So on the side of making and characterizing samples, uh, we're going to use robotics to create samples and then characterize samples. And what that does is allows new samples to be created very rapidly uh, and to be done uh, using precise controls that mean that the reliability is high. And that means that then is also associated metadata, which means the data is inherently transferable. So all of the data generated in this process can be shared and used together to advance, advance science forward. So this is going to mean that we have more data and perhaps also better data. Um, in addition to that, we're going to use any sort of machine algorithm we can to be able to choose each experiment so that we we uh, are able to use a real select you know the, the, get the most value out of that experiment. And there's a lot of different ways to do this. We've traditionally focused on Bayesian optimization, which breaks this into two processes: one, modeling the system, and then using an algorithm to select the experiment. And these two these two things kind of together mean that we're we're basically having more shots on goal, and the shots on goal have higher accuracy. So my group looks at this in a few different ways. Uh, we have kind of four areas of research. Uh, the first is in looking at how we can use 3D printing combined with robotics and mechanical testing to create structures out of polymer that has super superlative mechanical properties, things like a uh, very strong ability to absorb energy in, in accidents, things like you know, crumple zones in cars and these kinds of things. And using this approach, we found world record level mechanical efficiencies in polymeric structures. Additionally, uh, we've been developing systems that allow us to deposit and characterize polymer thin films using electrochemistry. And these are for applications in things like batteries, where they can precisely manage the transport of different materials, uh, different you know, lithium and electrons and such, in order for applications like battery electrolyte materials. And the main focus of the, at least the next few minutes, what we'll be talking about today, is what we, how we can use things like scanning probes that allow us to uh, position and do these sort of same sorts of experiments, but on an extremely miniaturized scale. Uh, and I'll mention as a last piece that a lot of our, my group's effort goes into uh, developing resources that allow these ideas, uh, both active learning as the process of choosing experiments in, you know, algorithmically and self-driving labs more generally, uh, developing pedagogical tools for others. Um, for example, using Wordle, the word game Wordle, as a way to sort of explore how to think about active learning, how maybe you can employ that in your research. And then also, if you're imagining running a self-driving lab, what should the human user be doing? And so developing kind of heuristic lessons that constitute a, a driving school for self-driving labs. But so the main focus of what I'd like to talk about today is, is looking at uh, how we can miniaturize this process. And so we look at the literature of the kinds of self-driving laboratories that have been developed around the world. Well, you'll notice that they vary a lot in the scale of the samples that they consider. For example, our work at 3D printing is at the gram scale. A lot of chemistry is at the gram scale. Things have been miniaturized down using things like um, you know, lasers and ablation techniques or thin films or miniaturization in microfluidic systems or even miniaturization on thin film on, on very small micro pillars. But there's, if we want to imagine doing, you know, the kinds of, you know, billions and upon billions of experiments, we want to miniaturize this as much as possible down to sort of the femtogram level. So the question is, how can we do this? Well, we need methods that allow us to both create and interrogate samples down at the scale, the femtogram scale. And so how do we do this? Well, um, the, te the technology we're going to explore that, that allows us to interrogate samples at the very small scales is the scanning probe microscope. And I know Sergey, uh, who I believe is talking next, will, will expand on this a lot with his, some of his tremendous work. But this is an instrument that allows you to position a very fine tip with extremely high spatial resolution and then measure and apply all sorts of different signals, things like electrostatic signals, magnetic signals, um, force signals to do things like friction measurements, uh, chem chemical forces, all sorts of things can be interrogated. So you have a, basically a multimodal probe that can be positioned in three dimensions uh, with nanoscale resolution. So this becomes a fantastic way to characterize samples on a very small scale. So this is a way to characterize. How are we going to make the samples? Well, making the samples, as it turns out, can also be done by a scanning probe. This plot shows 
the capital cost of equipment versus the resolution of patterning with that equipment. And what you'll notice is kind of down here in the low cost, high resolution limit is the AFM or atomic force microscope uh, using an, a dip pen a, a nanolithography modality. This is a technique where you basically take an AFM probe and you can put a drop of fluid or other material on this probe and use this to deposit this on the surface. And this allows you to write pretty reliably things at the submicron scale. And so this, this sort of observation that we have ways of patterning and characterizing materials with the same probe was a lot of what drove uh, my initial work. And so we had this idea, is it possible to take this scanning probe, one instrument, and have it do the entire automated side of this loop? And so when I started as, a, as an independent PI back in 2015, we had this idea, let's, let's do this. Um, and I can say that uh, it's very challenging. We've, we've made a lot of progress, but it should tell you something that um, all the functioning self-driving labs in my group are the larger scale. Um, but I'll, I'll share some of the progress that we've made in this and, and you'll see um, you know, where, we, where we've come today. And some of the first um, you know, innovations we made was, it was acknowledging that if we want to be able to do this reliably robotically, it's really critical that this system could have, have closed loop control over this patterning process, which currently wasn't, uh, wasn't possible in the world of dip pen analithography. So what we first realized back in 2017 was that this AFM probe behaves as a spring mass system, something that people have leveraged for a long time in the world of inertial sensing. But what we realized is if you put a drop of fluid on its tip, this will allow you to pattern amounts of fluid and measure what you've patterned to basically have real-time uh, imaging of what or characterization of what you've patterned. This alone wasn't enough for closed loop patterning because there's too many different ways that a drop can sit on a conical probe like this. But what we found is that if you use a tipless probe, this is an innovation that took us a few more years to make. Um, if you have a tipless probe, then you can have a very reliable contact between a drop and the surface, and you can modulate the amount of transport that occurs by changing the speed with which you withdraw this from the surface. And this allows you to not only measure, reliably measure the amount of fluid that's being deposited, but also adjust this in real time to really affect closed loop patterning. Showing you here, this is an example of a series of, 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 pat of features that we wrote with uh, predictive control over the size of the features. It was something that was not possible uh, previously in scanning probe lithography, at least in dip pen analithography. Uh, building on this, in, in the effort to go to very small scales, we learned that it's possible to put a spherical tip at the end of this cantilever, and this actually allows you to localize this drop, so you only need to have one um, mode that you're sensing inertial sensing, but then also it localizes this so you can have very, very fine uh, you have a very small drop and so you get very, very fine deposition, allowing us to pattern femtogram, femtogram scale quantities of fluid. Um, and to sense that, we actually need to use an extraordinarily sharp, so very high frequency probe, so the inertial sensing can be very sensitive, but it, we found that it is able, it, it is capable of, of measuring with a sort of femtogram scale uh, resolution the, the patterning of individual drops of fluid. And so most recently, what we found is sort of putting these ideas together, it's possible to pattern uh, drops of viscous polymer fluids, in this case, these are photocurable polymers, and then measuring, photo cross link them, and then to measure their mechanical properties using that same instrument. So basically, more or less uh, accomplishing this vision of patterning and characterizing with the same instrument. Here, looking at how the modulus of these of this material changes with feature height. This actually illustrates something kind of interesting here. When you go to the kind of bulk limit, these polymers attain one uniform value of about a gig gigapascal of modulus, but when they get thin, that, that drops off perhaps due to um, various uh, interactions between uh, the, uh, the, the air environment during uh, cross-linking. Uh, and so this is a kind of observation that's possible just because of this sort of uh, closed loop um, control. And so uh, I believe I'm out of time, so I'll just end by, by acknowledging the team and the, the funding agencies that made this work possible. Um, a lot of the work you heard about was the graduate work of Verda Saigon, the master's work of Nick uh, Pharmakidis. This work was largely uh, supported by the National Science Foundation. Um, so thanks very much. I'll, I'll hand it back over. Uh, and um, so I'm looking forward to hearing your questions later. Thank you very much, Keith. That's 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 wonderful, and and, and really appreciate that. Thank you, thank you. A lovely presentation. Thank you, um, Sergey. We pass to you next, I believe. Um, so hopefully you can see there. Thank you. Do you see my screen? Yes, that's perfect. Thank you. Ah, fantastic. So thank you very much for the introduction. So I'm happy to share some of the work that uh, we are doing now that is highly complementary to the direction that Keith have illustrated. And this is how uh, we can use the automated scanning probe and the electron microscopes to map 
structure property relationships and learn physics uh, of the materials. So this work uh, has been is something that we've been working on for the last uh, six years by now. So with uh, my colleagues at the uh, UT Knoxville, uh, my colleagues at Oak Ridge, and my colleagues at the Pacific Northwest uh, National Lab. So uh, as uh, Keith uh, just uh, wonderfully illustrated, we really need to go small to go big. So the reason for that is that the time scales and the opportunity to sample large regions of the uh, composition space of new materials is much larger when we deal with uh, small volumes. We simply don't invest as much money and effort into making samples and studying them. So uh, scanning probe microscopy and electron microscopes are the primary tool for doing that. So Keith have illustrated the use of SPM that can virtually measure everything, magnetic properties, electronic properties, ferroelectric properties. Uh, electron microscopes uh, generally have the comparable set of suits. We can use electron microscopes in order to map structure down to the atomic level, measure the chemical composition through EDX or EELS, probe the quasi-particle. So these are highly complementary techniques. Now, the thing that is common between the SPM and uh, electron microscopes is how we use them. So the moment that I choose my sample, put it in the microscope, go into the microscope room, uh, I basically start to perform a set of operations. Tune my microscope, find some region of interest, zoom in, uh, see what I, uh, I'm looking at, zoom out, perform the zoom in and zoom out operation several more times, maybe tune my microscope again, collect the spectral data. Then after I've done it, I go back to my office and uh, Whatever, to my cloud space and try to analyze it and learn something from the observations. The question, so this is an example of the very simple linear workflow. So if we combine the microscopy with synthesis or theory, the workflows become nonlinear, but this is just a, just a direct one. So the question becomes, what do we want, uh, what do we need in order to run the microscope as the fully automated experiment? So the first part of the answer is, of course, we just need to have a hyper language. So the way how our machine learning agent can issue commands to the microscope directly. But, and in many cases, this is a primary technical um, uh, barrier. But it turns out that if you look at the problem a little bit more deeper, we actually need to figure out why are we doing the microscope experiment. So we plan the experiment based on the prior knowledge and uh, while we perform the tens and hundreds of the operations uh, with the microscope, our decision making is informed by the objective of our project and by some form of specific reward function that we hope to optimize during the experiment. And it turns out that if we really want to uh, engender the automated microscopes, we have to have a very acute understanding of why we are doing science in the first place and define this uh, reward functions and objectives in a way that they can be communicated to the ML agent. So if we don't have a goal, we cannot uh, run the microscopes. And basically our planning of that automated experiment becomes a dance between the policies and rewards. So rewards is what we want to accomplish. How do we judge that a specific step of the experiment is successful? Policies is essentially the decision-making rule. What is that the microscope is doing based on the current state of the observation. And one point that I want to make is that if we can do this type of uh, planning for microscopy, we can use this knowledge for design of more complex workflows in synthesis, characterization, theory in the loop synthesis, and so on. If we cannot do it for the microscopy, uh, I think we, maybe we don't have a shot at more complex systems as well. And it turns out that for microscopy, in fact, we can do that. So as a few examples, uh, we can run the experiment when we have a machine learning as the part of the loop in the microscopy, and uh, we use the machine learning algorithm to analyze the data as it streams directly from the instrument. So it looks like it's a step edge finder, it's not. You can see that we find only one type of domain walls, but not the other type. And once we found this domain walls, we can perform certain type of experiments, for example, take the spectroscopy data only the domain walls and nowhere else. 
So we can realize the fully physical discovery. So there was a lot of uh, challenges. Can we use the autonomous system in order to learn physics by itself? It turns out that is doable. So we have realized the system which essentially explores the physics of the ferroelectric domain whole growth and uh, simply runs the microscope in order to discover what functional form is the domain will uh, have. So it's somewhat reminiscent of the work done by Flatiron Institute folks and uh, Google on uh, learning the laws of the gravitation from the astronomic observation. In our case, uh, we have an active experiment. So the microscope, the A agent plans what type of experiment to perform. It executes the experiment on the microscope, it analyzes the results, and performs the experiment in the closed loop. So this is actually uh, doable. In fact, we can run more complex experiments when we go well beyond what the human can do. So for example, human can plan the experiment when we choose the interesting objects and take some form of the spectroscopic measurements. However, a human cannot run the experiment where we select specific attribute of this spectra. For example, find the loops that have the maximal area and then try to learn what microstructural element maximize this response. So we can do it only if we take the data everywhere and then analyze it. So it turns out that if we make a hybrid of the uh, deep neural networks and the Gaussian process, the approach that is called the deep kernel learning, uh, we can run the essentially Bayesian optimization loop when our microscope looks for this object of interest. And you can see that it rather remarkably found that the hysteresis loop area is maximized on the domain wall. And that's something that we expect. Under slightly different conditions, uh, it will be maximized on the different domain wall. So it's interesting and uh, importantly, it works. Now, what is the future? So there was a very famous paper about uh, 10 years ago by uh, Shahri, Babak Shahriari and Nanda de Freitas about the, uh, taking the human out of the loop. And the idea was that uh, the way forward is for autonomous experiments purely without the humans. We all know that there is a problem with this approach. There is all this issue about the domain alignment and so on. But our belief is that we should never take human out of the loop. So we get to run the experiments only one time. It's not a static machine learning when we can tune the hyperparameter. Uh, it's a good assumption that experiment can be run only once, then something would be different. So what we believe is the way forward is to deal with the situations when it looks like the experiment gets stuck, is basically a transition from purely autonomous experiment to first to explainable autonomous experiment when we monitor the learning process, we monitor the real space trajectory, we monitor the feature space trajectory of the system and come up with the strategy for intervention. And that becomes super interesting because currently, both with microscopes and all other equipment, we have the human that issues the basic commands and then uh, observes the data, makes decision. In the purely automated experiment, we have the machine learning agent that issues basic commands and uh, analyze the data, we think that the both approaches are limited. So the correct way forward is to have the situation when the machine learning agent uh, controls the microscope and does it on the time scales and with the volumes of data that are intrinsic to the instrument, so meaning a lot and very fast. But the human agent, rather than controlling microscope directly, monitors the behavior of machine learning agent and adjusts the policies, makes it more curious or less curious, chooses the targets of exploration, kind of explore the physics or material optimization. And that in fact works. And uh, we believe that this uh, approach will become progressively more important once we start to integrate the automated workflows until multiple domains. So for example, simple Gaussian process by Asian optimization or structured Gaussian process and even multi-fidelity Gaussian processes can be used for fully autonomous workflows. Once we move to the multitask or multi-fidelity uh, structured Gaussian processes, we really need to balance our belief in physics, our belief in data, and how we want to couple the operation of multiple microscopes or multiple systems once they are co-orchestrated by the same machine learning agent. And that's the part which becomes uh, super curious, and I'm happy to pass on the 
presentation to Amanda, so she talks about the ML aspect for that. Thank you. Thank you very much, so guys. That's very interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, Amanda, I believe you should have the controls with you now. Thank you. Thank you. And I have the con. Can you see my screen? We can. Yes, and we can hear you well. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, I can't see my screen. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. I'm going to pick up on some of the uh, ideas that Sergey was talking about, about human in the loop and how we can explain the outcomes from machine learning. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about explainable AI, mostly applied to structured data, to give uh, humans a bit of an understanding of not only what is predicted, but how and why a machine learning predicts a particular outcome. So nanoinformatics is a part of, I guess, the materials informatics community, which is a series of different types of technologies that include machine learning, deep learning, AI, data science. These are all quite different kinds of techniques in computing. I'm in a computer science school. And so we use a lot of these techniques in the work that I do on nanotechnology and other areas. Nanoinformatics is a bit more complicated than materials informatics because it has all of the complexities of materials, such as changes in crystallinity and defects, but with the constraints and combinatorial issues we see in chemistry. So it's a very exciting place to work. And there's a diverse amount of literature in the field that uses these different techniques. To date, most of it is focused on automation, as we've seen in the last two presentations. Uh, identification using segmentation, which is a type of deep learning, different kinds of screening of nanomaterials using data science techniques, uh, a lot of work generating structure property relationships using mostly machine learning, I'll touch on some of that today, and modelling the processes behind uh, different kinds of behaviours using optimization methods, which are a class of AI. So focusing now on machine learning, ultimately we'll be with the premise behind machine learning is that the computers are able to program themselves. Uh, this uh, represents quite an acceleration of the scientific method because it means that we can develop the structure or the architecture of a model and solve it at the same time. For the most part in nanotechnology, we've been using supervised machine learning, which means that we can either uh, develop a model that predicts categories or different kinds of properties of a material. So using either a classifier to uh, predict a discrete output, such as one type of a nanomaterial or another, or regressors that in, can estimate a continuous property, such as a temperature dependent property or something like that. And from those supervised learning, we're able to ingest historical data of observations, either from experimental or computational sources, and predict an outcome on an unseen data instance. But in many cases, to make a scientific decision, we actually require more information than that. We would also like to know how a machine learning model makes that decision, so that we can use that potentially to guide what kind of things we're going to do next in our own uh, greater research workload. So I've shown here at the top the outcome from a decision tree predicting classes. And even though this is quite a simple, shallow decision tree, it's very clear to understand how the tree has uh, made the decisions in order to develop the model architecture. Looking at the bottom here, though, when we move to regressor, these trees can become very deep and very complicated, and it becomes a lot more tricky to understand exactly how the model predicts the outcome. In addition to knowing how, however, we'd also like to know why. Why does a model predict a particular outcome? And in particular, how is it using the different kinds of features to explain the fundamental input-output relationship? Uh, this is in nanotechnology, what we would call a structure property relationship. So when we think about interpreting models, there's a three, four different ways that uh, um, concepts that we need to first read to have a look at. One is transparent models. There are very few truly transparent models in machine learning and these are models where a human can understand the process of the development of the model. Uh, we usually see this because the model parameters reflect how the data is used. 
An example of that is linear regression, for example. Interpretable models are models where a human can understand how the architecture of the model developed. And these usually give us some kind of output, expose something like a feature importance profile that demonstrate how the different features were used in the development of the architecture of the model. Examples of these kinds of interpreter models include Naive Bayes, K nearest neighbors, and the, all of the kind of ensemble tree based models that are used a lot for structured tabular data. Of course, there are uninterpretable models, and these are the kind of models where a human cannot understand how the model architecture was developed. It's not immediately obvious from looking at the functional form, and these are either because there's extremely complex mechanisms within the algorithm or very intricate decision making processes that came to develop the model itself or both. Examples of these are support vector machines, Gaussian processes, and neural networks, which are used ubiquitously across many areas of nanoscience and technology. So if we take the single neuron from a neural network and have a look at how uh, this is developed. So we've got our output, we have an activation function, we have a weight over a different feature, and then a bias. And we can see how this is very similar to a linear regressor, and it's very explainable, uh, interpretable, sorry. And then, however, when we move to a more advanced neural network with multi-layers, then we've got all of the different weights over the neurons H for layers L, and we can find that this is actually a much more complicated function that is very difficult for a human to be able to reason about how these different weights were developed. In addition to this, a neural network of this type, which is called a multi-layer perceptron, will actually map all of the different uh, trends and patterns within the data, even those that are not directly related to a structure property relationship. An example from my own research looking at uh, look, uh, predicting biomarkers for ovarian cancer, a neural network will often pick up the pattern associated with the batches or the time of day that patients were tested. And of course, this has nothing to do with a diagnosis of cancer. So in this case, we need to turn to what's called explainable artificial intelligence or XAI. And this is a collection of different kinds of uh, post hoc model agnostic methods that you can apply after you've trained a neural network or any other kind of uninterpretable uh, machine learning model to actually understand that fundamental relationship between the inputs and outputs, understanding why certain features were used to predict a certain property. There's a variety of different examples. I've listed some here. And today we're going to talk a little bit about using Shapley values. I'll point out at this stage though that model agnostic does not mean model independent. The explanations we receive are directly for the model that we've trained. Train a different model, you'll get a different explanation. And if we did want to have a completely model independent explanation, there are ways to apply these same methods using what's called a Rashomon set. And I'll encourage you to read this paper that's coming out this year uh, in a top machine learning conference. The case study we're going to use today to explore this is uh, these concepts is graphene oxide. So this is a small data set containing only 16, just over 1600 data instances or data points. And it has a combination of different patterning and concentrations of oxygen and oxygen related groups on the surface of a continuous sheet of graphene. This was originally calculated with density functional type binding. I'm not going to go into very much detail about that. You'll probably hear more about combining data science and simulation with machine learning with our next speaker. And this particular data set, which you can find at the reference shown there on the left, uh, is characterized by three different types of descriptors, a chemical, a physical, and what we sort of recall uh, an engineering type descriptor that cover 500 different uh, individual feature attributes, capturing things such as the elemental and molecular concentrations, uh, the different kinds of bonding characteristics, the graphene structure such as ring statistics, and also the patterning of the graphene, uh, of, of the functional groups on the graphene. Uh, we have two ind individual property labels that will predict independently here so that you can sort of see the different kinds of performance levels depending on how difficult they are to predict. Uh, in this case, the work was originally confined in the supporting information of the reference I provided here. And following data cleaning, which reduced the feature states down from 500 to 406, 
two different shallow neural networks using a multi-layer perceptron were trained and uh, to predict, the, as I mentioned, the formation energy and the Fermi energy. Here are the outcome results from these two different predictors. Uh, we're seeing the results here on the testing sets, which was 25% of the data set. Uh, on the left here, we can see an almost perfect prediction of the formation energy and the discrete uh, intervals of data instances that are all overlapping, we're showing here, are due to the way the data was originally sampled. And so this is actually an indicator of how important it is to make, think about sampling of the feature space when developing data sets for machine learning. Over here on the right, we can see the prediction for the testing set on the Fermi level. And we can see we've got also a very excellent prediction, but there's scatter around that uh, the comparison between the predicted value and the true value. And this indicates that we're likely to have some overfitting. When we move to the learning curves on the training set, we can see evidence of this overfitting. In the case of the formation energy, we've converged to just over 600 instances where we have a perfect result. And so in this case, even though 600 training instances is not big data, it's big enough data. And when we move to the Fermi energy, it's a different case. We have not yet seen convergence between the cross-validation score and the training score. So this model outcome could be improved if more data were available. We do see around 2% underfitting, which means and perhaps extra layers in the multi-layer perceptron could have improved the outcome. We also see a minor amount of overfitting, which means that the day, the actually the multi-layer perceptron is starting to fit to the noise. Perhaps more data cleaning could have improved this result. We've cleaned the data the same for both of the uh, two different uh, uh, property labels. And so today it's just for the purposes of demonstration. So how do we explain why, how and why different features were used and which features were used to develop these high, highly high performing predictions? Shapley values are actually a solution in what's called cooperative game theory. And I've shown uh, the development of the model here. It's uh, developed by Lord Shapley in the 1950s and received a Nobel Prize for economics. One of the best ways to understand how a Shapley value is calculated is to use this bottom uh, equation here. So for a given machine learning model, for example, that contained four different features operating on a coalition S, that contained only x1 and x2, then the marginal contribution for the remaining ones that are excluded can be described by this integral with an expectation function. Uh, the good news is that this has all been coded up very well and is provided here uh, on, at this GitHub location for anybody who wants to use it and some excellent documentation to explain both the theory and the implementation, which uses Monte Carlo sampling to make it less computationally intensive because for those that were paying attention, we do have some factorials up there in the original equation. The outcome we receive from the SHAP code calculating the Shapley values gives us the value or the impact of the individual feature on the model itself. Here they've been ordered for the top ones that are used most frequently in, uh, and are most important to the prediction and they're coloured here by the feature value. So we can see that for the prediction of the formation energy, when the feature value for the hydrogen concentration is highest, this has the most impact on the prediction. When the concentration of the relative concentration of the carbon in graphene oxide is lowest, this is also highly impactful on the prediction of the formation energy. This is slightly different when we return to the formation energy uh, sorry, the prediction of the Fermi energy, where we can see different types of characteristics of the graphene oxide are very important and at different feature values. We can also aggregate all of this, um, all of the Shapley values to obtain a very traditional kind of feature importance profile, which is similar to the ones that we would receive from using a tree-based model, such as a decision tree or a random forest. 
In this case, we can also use these feature importance profiles, the ranking of how uh, important the features are to the prediction uh, and see which features we might designate as important, which ones are relatively unimportant, or in this case, when they are adding no value whatsoever to the prediction, which of the structural characteristics are probably nuisance variables. Knowing this kind of information might help us target the next round of experiments, knowing which in particular features of the graphene oxide we would be able to tune in the lab to uh, tune the material. So we know from these results that the prediction of the formation energy is uh, related to the concentration of elements and functional groups. That the Fermi energy is highly dependent on concentrations of some of the oxygen related groups. And the features describing things like bonding and ring statistics are, are more important than patterning, but these are less important variables. So this is something we can actually act upon. But what about the individual instances? We had 1600, just over 1600 data instances, and are they all equally important to the prediction? Are there some experiments that could be done in a lab or simulations that were done on a supercomputer that are less important, that are perhaps nuisance instances, or some that are really critical to the decision and the kind of experiments or simulations we actually should do more of? It is possible to use Shapley values based on the local explanations from the SHAP code to aggregate across the features and create an instance influence profile that ranks the, in, the impact or the importance of each individual data point. And so here's the results for the formation energy and for the Fermi energy. And this looks like quite dense. It is actually a histogram, but we've got over 1600 bars in these bar charts. And we can see that some of there is a decline. There's obviously some instances of data points that are much more influential than others. There's also discontinuities where something is changing. So if we focus in just on the top here for the most influential instances, and we can see here they're numbered, so we know which ones they are for both the formation energy and the Fermi energy, and they are different. Certain data points in the data set were much more important or influential in calculating in the prediction of the Fermi energy than they were in the prediction of the formation energy. We can also have a look at what's happening around some of these discontinuities, turning to the local explanation from the Shapley values and seeing why in particular this data instance, for example, is less influential than this one. This is done with what's called a false plot. So as false plot is another great output from the code that can be applied, and it gives us effectively a feature importance profile for every single data instance. In the case of the most important data instances for the prediction of the formation and the Fermi energies, we can see here that the concentration of oxygen, of first stop uh, hydrogen, then carbon, then oxygen, and then ether, in this order of importance for this particular instance, are all working towards pushing up the Fermi energy, the formation energy. So they're actually contributing to making this particular data point more unstable. In the case of the most important data instance for the Fermi energy, the oxygen concentration, the carbon concentration, and some of the bonding characteristics are actually the most influential in pushing the Fermi energy to a lower energy. We can see for these uh, around this discontinuity as well, the formation energy itself doesn't change very much. And there's actually very little in the top features for this particular instance, there's not a lot of difference in which ones are most influential. And we would have to look to some of the less influential features to determine what was different about these two that made one of them more influential than others. Similarly, when we look to the Fermi energy, we can actually look at what types of concentrations, and here we can see there's a big difference in a very low carbon concentration pushing the uh, Fermi energy to a lower energy. And just on the other side of the discontinuity, we have a slightly higher carbon concentration and a lower oxygen concentration also pushing the Fermi energy down. We can do the same kind of analysis for the unimportant instances and understanding why some of the instances that would very far to the right at the lower end of these instance influence profiles, uh, what kind of features are create, making them less influential and do that analysis on any instance we want. Interestingly, when we do that analysis on the low energy instances, 
the one that we've probably expended quite a lot of computational time to find, which is the thermodynamic ground state. These are not influential instances in terms of the prediction of these two properties. So a flow chart to be able to do this, we can either simulate a data set or measure them. We've seen some great examples of measuring data in the last two presentations. In this case, we've looked at structured tabular data, but it doesn't have to be. It could be signals, it could be images, it could even be text. We've got a data set where we then train a model, process the data, train a model, which we think then potentially could interpret if we've got an interpretable outcome. We then can use that to predict some kind of important property of the nanomaterial of interest, evaluate the models to determine if there's any, uh, how their performance, underfitting, overfitting, and other kinds of characteristics of the model itself, and perhaps use that to infer information about unseen nanomaterials. If we want to understand some of the underlying reasons for that prediction, we can use explainable AI. In this case, we've had a look at Shapley values uh, implemented through the SHAP code to look at detailed feature importance profiles, instance influence profiles, and also the combination of the two, the feature importance for an individual instance and understand exactly how and why certain data instances are giving rise to a particular prediction, in this case, Fermi energy and formation energy. So interpretation and explanation in machine learning are actually not, not the same thing. And in many cases, what we need in nanoscience and technology is an explanation. Uh, intrinsic and postdoc interpretation of a model architecture can be useful in explaining how a model uses the data, but in order for us to act on that information in the lab, what we really need is to understand why a certain feature, a certain structure is used to predict a certain property. Model architecture is not the same thing as a structure property relationship. For graphene oxide, we were able to show that the, uh, the hydrogen containing groups are most important in predicting the formation energy, whereas the more oxygen related uh, features are more important for the Fermi energy. The features describing things like the bonding are more important than the patterning of the groups on the surface, which is good because patterning of oxygen on graphene oxide very difficult. Uh, the more unstable structures are the ones that are actually highly influential and it's important to include those in the data set to improve the prediction ability. That's rather counterintuitive when we feel that only stable structures should be included in a machine learning model prediction, but unstable with respect to what? I mean, the machine learning model really needs a more comprehensive data set to be able to give a reliable outcome. And that low energy structures, although I didn't show them here, the low energy structures are actually not among the most influential. So with that, I'll conclude with some acknowledgements. Uh, a few of the group members that are specifically working on things related to explainable AI in my group. Some previous group members that contributed to the work on graphene oxide and my experimental collaborator from CSIRO, Professor Bron Fox. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Amanda. Thank you. And we will um, pass over to, to Yara for the last presentation. Hi, I can see you, Yara. And, um, thank you very much. Yeah, I can see your screen. Thank you. OK, so um, I'll um, talk about uh, something that my group is very passionate about. It's uh, how to bridge simulation experimental data into one large data set that is um, simultaneously will be um, able to predict materials properties. So I want to start with very quickly to introductory concept, <clears throat> which I see always uh, get interchangeable in materials community. There's data fusion and data integration. So the difference is data integration, you combine data from different sources, so you can see data sources with unified view. For example, that would be a knowledge graph approach. And that the fusion is you integrating the data, collecting, integrating, and then you figure out how to accurately and consistently um, merge this data into uh, one data source, which should be more accurate than any individual source itself. Um, we know that uh, materials properties can be characterized by many experimental computational techniques. The problem here is that we have many different levels of information coming from different um, uh, at the levels of resolutions or time or spatial constraints. 
even if we take just experimental techniques, we can measure the same information with different experimental techniques. That means that uh, we somehow have to unify it if we want to use, for example, for one sample in MR, for another one XRD. Uh, on top of this, we can back up almost all the experimental techniques with computational techniques, right? So, for example, XPS can be compared with DFT simulations or FTIR and MD or coarse grain can be compared directly with DLS. So in my group, we work on the workflows that first integrate the data. So it's collecting the data um, from simulations experiments. On top of this, we like to integrate with different levels, like such as device materials, device performance, user data, and also visualize it with multi-dimensional data, for example, all lab cube. Um, then we'll uh, try to do a data fusion, which is uh, um, usually with uncertainty for quantification, or at least if we have a sparse or a uh, small data set, we can uh, employ data imputations or data communications, and after that, we apply machine learning. I'll just focus on our attempts to do data integration and data fusion, and I start with data fusion. I feel like I always have to show this uh, very quickly. So this is example on the tire materials. If we have a tire material, we have many different components, different type of rubbers, fillers, could be silicon nanoparticles, could be carbon blocks, could be all kinds of different things, and a whole bunch of little molecules, antioxidants, uh, antioxidizers, softeners, organizations, additives. Um, if we look at available hypothetical data space, you know, property one, property two, we, what we're going to see that only small data uh, that is available to us will be ready for machine learning. Usually this data is clustered, can come from various sources, and for tire materials, it also will be proprietary, so we're most likely not going to even have it availability. So what do we need to do if we need to really optimize this pretty far away from the original collected data? Technically, we can use simulations because simulations can model pure materials, ideal condi conditions. Um, we don't care about how expensive materials are, and we can observe processes that cannot be observed experimentally, whether they real or not, it's a different question. So what we can do actually with simulations, we can sample then set up simulations that pure materials, different constraints, and sample much larger effectively space. We can measure the same things from simulations as uh, well, the same material properties as with experiment, diffusions on a certain accuracy, mechanical properties, different oxidation, even if we want to. The question is, how do we then merge it all together um, into one space reliably and we use both data from experiments and simulations for the same type of prediction? Um, we have an approach where we use it by common observations. So this is normal for simulations to do first validation. Some people do, some people don't, but it's a good practice to do validations where you validate your simulations approach with some experimental data. We can use this observation to quantify, for example, the uncertainty associated with the computational approach. Um, for example, if we're looking at distribution of iron oxide nanoparticles for experimental, we're going to see a large-scale distribution. If we do the simulations, we're going to have just one size of the nanoparticle, for example, on atomistic level. Um, now, if we measure the properties, as for example, here we're looking at TGA experiments and MD simulations comparison for the same exact system, the same size of nanoparticles, we're going to see differences, right? And some of the differences can be quite pronounced. Even though we can reach quantitative agreement, we're going to see a specific difference associated with this difference in side distribution concentrations, different types of solvents, or even depletion versus non-depletion interactions. We, we're going to have uh, some issues associated with periodic boundary conditions, especially for absor absorption. What can we do? So if we find this kind of common observations, and we're going to validate the simulation. After this, we can do the perform the uncertainty quantifications of computational data in order to assess um, associated error with computational data before we go into machine learning. However, the general uncertainty quantification is a really good idea for both experimental and computational data for different reasons, as you can see here. So let I'm going to show you my little example. Um, generally, force field for simulation is very difficult, and we have some partial charges here that is important for organic uh, materials. 
So we decided to do uncertainty quantification, very careful one on some, some simple liquid acinetril. Um, the input parameters would be MD simulations force fields, and the output parameters will calculate what macroscopic properties, density, dipole moment, solubility parameter, diffusion coefficients. Then we're going to see how well the model is going to present and what is our biggest source of error. So first of all, I'm going to show you what the problem with the data space here. This is, again, small, very well-known liquids. However, if you look at the partial charges associated with each of these types of atoms, we're going to see a huge variation across different types of published papers, 2017, 2012. You can see the variation can be from 5% to as much as 30 or 50%. Uh, within this parameter. So if we plot it, we're going to see pretty sparse distribution of this type of partial charges. So what we did actually, we sampled out of these partial charges, we created many different simulations, and we ran the simulations for <coughs> a significant amount of time, but well, for the small system, one on a second, for the equilibrium protocol. And then we measured the experimental property, the macro properties. The sensitivity measurements then showed us, so this is normalized sensitivity versus uh, deviation from experimental measurements, that the only reliable information for us is really density, which is kind of silly because it comes from non-bonded interactions. But we also can have reliably calculate, for example, part of the solubility parameter. We can see the diffusion coefficient is really actually it has huge error associated with that. And the other parameters depends on how electronegative your molecule is. We also design a little machine learning code that allows to do this type of calculations much faster. You know, originally we spent a lot of time. What would we use this type of information for? We would use basically to put some weight into fitness function. There is many different things you can do here with statistics of how you're going to quantify one versus another. But we basically choose that with uncertainty quantification, we can figure out um, some weight function for the fitness. And that's what allows us to unify um, the different types of properties that are associated with from simulations to experiments into the so, same unified map. Um, another part I want to show is very, very quickly data integration. So data fusion is laborious. It's uh, difficult in a way that you have to have a pretty good sampling to understand where the error is coming from and then quantify them. The, the integration is a little bit more straightforward. So we gather the data, and then the next things we have to fuse it together. We can fuse it or integrate it using um, knowledge graphs. So we did it together in collaboration with Rada Cherkova from computer science here at NC State. Um, we also can automatically gather with natural language processing, such as ontology that associated with all this data, and um, perform some data processing. And after that, we can do the data analytics, what we're going to see, we're actually going to visualize data so we can pull different types of properties from different types of source of data. So, for example, if I want IR data from different types of molecules, I can be able to parse it with my uh, search and visualize and download and analyze all this type of data. Keep in mind at this point it's not fused because there is no uncertainty quantification performing that. On top of this, we're going to see the data will have quite a bit of the sparsity. How do we fuse the data here? What's the integration step? Very quickly, merging simulations experiments. So for example, these simulations are performed with uh, Brooke Myers, from, well, sorry, from my group, an experiment performed by Brooke Myers from um, Marquette University, that we can perform, for example, the uh, phosphate capture by protein type of materials or simulations and experiment, different level of interactions. We can then go through the ontology development uh, based, uh, so we'd be figuring out with natural language processing what type of keywords we have there, and then transform this data into a knowledge graph. So here you see that this data is knowledge graph for, for simulations. This is for experiment. What's the interconnect? The interconnect basically is the commonality here. The commonality will be a tar type of analyte that we're capturing. So, for so example, here's orthophosphate, protein, type of protein solvent or protein sequence, temperature, phosphate binding. So, that would be common observation. The rest of them are not. So, we can then data mine the, that type of approach. However, there's another type of things that you have to know before we actually can data mine anything. Because let's say in simulations, I can have this specific protein that I looked at and experiment, I can do, do this and another protein. How do I then unify these data spaces? 
We have two different problems with materials data sets, generally sparse data and small data sets. We um, try to develop new workflows that allows us to fill the missing values and expand the data sets. Both of these workflows you can see kind of here, they based both of these workflows based on um, data imputations, multiple data imputations, couple of software available uh, or methods available. That's a million mice that both fit material data quite well. So that allows us to expand the data and then integrate it with the knowledge graph. And that allows us to expand our um, the uh, data sets. Another one, I just want to show you the future of the, uh, this type of approaches. So we take the data fusion, data integration, um, data fusion laborious. So it's going to catch up slowly with data integration. Data integration gives us immediate information from multiple sources. So this type of approach can be easily applied to traditional material search, where we're trying to find new material here and go through the loop of material selection, characterization, structure, property, performance, and so forth. However, an interesting part here that we're usually not considering is this performance in devices, performance in natural environment, and user-specific data of the materials. So we call this approach convergence informatics when we have even higher level heterogeneous data that we're trying to fit into the materials informatics with the data fusion techniques that allows us to come to new solutions and optimize them in a different way. So to summarize very quickly, uh, data integration can be achieved with knowledge graphs. This type of Neo4j is available for material scientists. Data fusion is a bit more, more difficult, it requires uncertainty quantification sensitivity analysis. Also good to have data imputation argumentation to make sure all your data sets are prepared for that type of integration. And of course, we'll always need new convergence methods and solutions. And I'd like to thank my group for this, my collaborator, Rada Cherkova, and our funding that sponsored our research. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yara. That was wonderful. Really, really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you to all the speakers also. Thank you. Um, uh, we've, we've gone just a couple of minutes over time, so we will have just two very quick questions, if that's okay. And if I can ask folks just to get answer in under a minute or so, if, that was, if that's possible to the, to the questions. Um, I'll just run through a couple that I've just picked out from the list that have come in here. Um, the first one is um, to yourself, Keith, and, and to yourself, Sergei, I think, as well. Um, regarding how did, how did the, with the self-driving labs, how, how do they choose the next experiment, let's say, within, within that process? So maybe starting with yourself there, Keith, if you could comment on that. Yeah, sure. Um, that's a that's a that's a nice question, and um, you know, I think I think actually all the speakers could probably speak to this a little bit because there was there was you know nuggets of of this in in, in all of them. I think the the simplest way that a uh, self driving lab chooses experiments is is by building models on the data that it, it has already. Um, an example of that being a Gaussian process regression. Uh, more complicated models exist as well, and then using some predetermined function uh, to assess which which location is most likely to give um, the, the best results and that's determined by some value judgment the experimenter makes like maybe the goal is to find a structure with the largest band gap or something like this and so it's looking to maximize that property now there are other um, considerations and other ways to get information into the system i think um, you know you using finding ways of fusing data that we heard about i think um, is, is a good one of of having um, you know more than one data stream um, versus just experiment uh, and also having what you might say is multi-fidelity, so having different actions you can take based upon some other, some cost or time associated with that. And so there's often mul multiple different actions that can be taken as well, but really it's a, there's an algorithm uh, that, you know, and this can be Bayesian optimization, it can be reinforcement learning, it can be any number of things, um, but it's, you know, built to, to choose the next experiment. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. And Yes, uh, open floor to anyone who has any um, thoughts on that question, if possible. 
Uh, I'll just add something from a computer science perspective. Active learning is often used to improve model performance, not necessarily converge on a target outcome. So it's used a little bit differently in some of the application areas like in materials where, as Keith mentioned, we might be focusing on trying to find a material with a particular band gap. In computer science, we want a comprehensive description of the data set. And so often the new data instances or the new experiments to run would be designed to maximise the variance rather than minimise the variance and focus on a property. Thank you. Thank you. I can I can see your micro is your microphone on there, Sir Guy? Uh, sorry, I, I can't see if you're okay. Uh, um, in that case, one 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 last quick question, folks, um, if, if that's okay then. Um, and perhaps this is for you uh, first up, Yara. Um, how, how do um, data interaction techniques differ between the fields? Let's say, we, so if you could um, if you could talk a little bit to that, that would that would be lovely. Thank you. So generally, data fusion and integration comes from computer science, and the, most of the um, methods were developed for biomedical data and uh, marketing analysis, right? Mm -hmm. So there is mm -hmm. a some uh, um, activation energy uh, required to learn these tools and migrate our data, which is a bit different because, again, we don't have such a big veracity of data. We have actually pretty small and sparse data sets as compared to marketing uh, in general. So there is some adaptation. Not every tool is available for us, but a lot of tools that are listed, some of them on my slide, is actually um, pretty useful for material science but we are in material science we're a little behind the rest of the uh, big fields with big data i understand thank you so much thank you and um thank you all so much again for the lovely presentations Re really enjoyed it and we have some lovely comments from from the from the audience here and so on and, and thank you Thank you so much for the time. The recording will be available afterwards um, using the link that you signed up to register for the webinar. And um, yeah, my thanks to all. And um, yeah, thank you. Hopefully see you at the next one. <laughs> thank you very much, everybody. Bye-bye.